Let us pray. Lord Jesus, your gifts are more than we could ever count. And they are offered to us every day. But too often our arms are filled with the things we think are important, so we never put them down and pick your gifts up. And so we slog through the days, burdened, filled with care and worry. Teach us to put down the things of life and pick up the things of eternal life. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, it seems that a Baptist preacher and a Lutheran pastor found themselves seated next to one another on a flight. And when the airplane had reached that cruising altitude and leveled off, the flight attendant came around asking people what they wanted to drink. And the Baptist preacher asked for an apple juice, and the Lutheran pastor asked for a glass of wine. Well, as the pastor's taking a sip of this glass of wine, he glances over the preacher and notices that he's getting a frown of disapproval. Well, you know, Jesus turned water into wine, and you love Jesus, don't you? said the pastor. Yes, I love Jesus, replied the preacher, but I'd love him a lot more if he hadn't done it. The really incredible thing that causes us to love Jesus is not so much that he turned water into wine, but he turned water into eternal life. That's the incident we find today in the Gospel of John. Let me kind of set this scene for you. Palestine is only 120 miles long from north to south. But within that 120 miles, in Jesus' day, there were three distinct Territories. Galilee was at the extreme north, Judea at the extreme south, and Samaria right in the middle. And there was this centuries-old feud between the Jews and the Samaritans that was so noxious that a Jew would travel around Samaria to go either north or south, effectively making a three-day journey, a six- to seven-day journey by that detour. Jesus wanted to get to Galilee as soon as possible, so they headed straight ahead into hostile territory, the shortest route. And on the way, they come to this town called Sychar. But just short of Sychar, the road to Samaria forks. And as the late, great Yogi Berra once said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. And at the fork in the road, there stands what is known as Jacob's Well. And this was a place of great memory for the Jews. This piece of ground had been bought by Jacob, and on his deathbed, he had bequeathed it to Joseph. Upon Joseph's death in Egypt, his body was brought back to Palestine and was buried in that territory. A lot of memories surrounded this place. The well is more than a hundred feet deep, and it's not a spring well, it is a dug well. And so water gathers and percolates from the ground into the bottom of it. But it's clearly so deep that you have to have something to draw the water with. And when Jesus and his band of followers gets to this well, this fork in the road, it's noon, it's time to rest. And as he's sitting there, this woman of Samaria comes to draw water. Now... This is a little bit strange in itself because she lives in the village of Sychar, but she comes to this well to draw water. And this well is a half mile from her home. And in her hometown, there is a well there also. And not only strange that she comes this distance, but she comes at this hour. She comes at noon. You see, water was usually drawn in the morning at daybreak so morning meals could be prepared and washings could be done, drawn at sundown in the evening for the same purposes. And the only reason you would come to draw water at noon is to avoid the other people who came to draw water, perhaps to avoid their wagging tongues, their snide remarks. Apparently, this woman's moral compass pointed in a direction that most people found distasteful. That becomes clear when Jesus is talking to her and reveals something that he knows about her. She's had five husbands, and she's currently living with a man who's not her husband. 
And you know what? He doesn't care. He doesn't berate her for her lifestyle, her implied immorality. He doesn't put her down for her questionable life choices. He's not interested in the level of her morality. He's interested in the level of her spirituality. He could care less about her status and situation, but he cares a lot about the status of her soul. And this is the true beginning of the universal scope of the gospel. Here God is so loving the world. Not in theory, but in action. And he gently confronts this woman whose life is a mess. He never once chastises her because he loves her. He cares about her heart. He doesn't care what's socially correct. Yes, she is imperfect. Who isn't? Being human means being imperfect. And this is important because it's an imperfect world in which we live. It's the only one we've got. And if God does not love imperfect people, then God has no one to love. But God does love imperfect people. God loves us. And that's what Jesus is conveying to this woman. And he wants to give her something that's going to satisfy her, the hunger in her, the thirst. The hunger and thirst that she's tried to feed with countless relationships. He wants to give her something that's going to change her, not for the moment, but forever. And the first step is that he doesn't condemn her, but he offers her the opportunity for change. And he offers a gift that if she will take it, will allow her to be the woman she wants to be and the child of God she needs to be. And then there will be no more noon hour trips to a distant well. No more revolving door relationships. No more wagging tongues and snide remarks. She will be free and whole. And does she accept Jesus' offer? Well, after some debate and attempts to change the subject on her part, and Jesus always brings it back around, we know that she does accept his offer because she goes back to the city, the city in which she has been a topic of conversation, and she says, guess what, folks? I met the Messiah. But she does something else. She does something that tells us she's not only accepted Jesus' offer, but she intends to take the gift and leave her old life behind. Never again will she be who she was. In verse 28, of that chapter in John, there's clear-cut evidence that she is born anew. Take a look at it. No, take a look at it. Verse 28, what does she do? <laughs> Who said it? Ken. She leaves her water jar behind. She leaves behind the symbol of her past life. Never to pick it up again. Literally at a fork in the road, the woman makes a choice. When she sees herself through the eyes of Jesus, she makes a choice. She puts down the symbol of what she was, and she moves forward to what she can be. We never really see ourselves until we see ourselves in the presence of Christ and then begins the sudden realization that we are not living life as we want to, should, or could be. We awake to ourselves and we awake to our need for God. And the marvelous thing about our faith, the marvelous thing about the grace is that it offers us a choice. Every day we come to a fork in the road. Every day when you get out of bed, put your feet on the floor, there is the fork. <coughs> Each day, by virtue of waters of baptism, we're given a choice. We can move forward in life, the life that Jesus offers us, a life of grace, or we can keep slogging through the same old, same old mess of life the way we do it. We do have a choice. If you and I really want to be immersed in the living waters that Jesus offers we have to put down our water jars. We have to put down those things that keep us from the abundant life that Jesus offers and never 
pick them up again. And we can do it. And that might be change just for the sake of change, but that's the only solution. Ask yourself, what is my water jar? Not mine, what is yours? I know what mine are. I got a whole bunch. Say to yourself, what is my water jar? What symbolizes that thing in my life that I need to drop at the fork? The fork between new life and same old stuff. What is it that's crippling me, stunting my growth, destroying my life, my relationship, my career, my health, my future, my loves, my everything? What is that water jar? Is it an addiction that needs to be overcome? A compulsion, obsession. Perhaps it's an attitude that needs to be discarded. A hurt that needs to be let go. Maybe it's something that you need to forgive in another person who's wronged you. Maybe it's something you need to confess that you need to have forgiven. Are there things from the past that should have been discarded? All that baggage from childhood and young adulthood, the disappointments, the emotional scars, the abuse, the sins. You know, there are reasons why we hold on to that stuff in our lives. One reason is sometimes we just don't know how to let it go, how to get it fixed up, or where to find help. Well, that's when you come to Pastor Emily and I. And if we can't help you, we know the people who can. So if that's your excuse, let it go. It's not working. Another reason people hang on to that baggage and garbage is because change is difficult and it hurts and we got enough pain. Who wants more? But the pain of letting go guarantees release and relief. Yes, change is difficult. But it's more difficult to live with chronic misery when Jesus can offer you permanent relief. And yet another reason some people do not want change and new life is that their stuff has defined who they are. And if they change, they just might have to move on and be new people and drop all that stuff and become different. I once knew a woman who suffered from a chronic debilitating illness. She was in terrible shape for 20 years. Seriously, she was. And then she got cured. And she was... Mad as the devil. She was angry because now she had to do things herself. She had to be like everybody else. Her illness had to find her. It had gotten her sympathy, got her a lot of perks in life. People had at one time literally done everything for her, and now she was able to do it herself. And she didn't want to. She didn't like that. She didn't know how at first. But with the love and grace of a community of faith and friends who loved her enough to let her be in pain, she got over the fear of being independent. And now she wouldn't pick that up again for anything. She's free. And what Jesus offered that woman at the well was a chance to start over A chance to be independent of the things that had previously defined her life. And that's what Jesus offers us. As he met the woman at the waters of Jacob's well, so he meets us at the waters of baptism. He gathers us at this table of grace to remind us that through bread and wine, God does love the world and those in it, imperfect as we are. Remember, as I've told you before, God doesn't love you because you are good. God loves you because God is good. It's absolutely amazing to see what Jesus can do with water. He makes wine. He offers eternal life. He promises new beginnings. Don't you just love him for that? I know I do. Amen.